clock just turned, so let's go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's CryoEM Service Centers webinar, uh, organized by the three national centers established by the NIH Common Fund Transformative High Resolution Cryoelectron Microscopy Program. Uh, those three centers are the Stanford SLAC CryoEM Center, S2C2, located at the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory at Stanford University, um, and they've organized today's seminar. Uh, also, the Pacific Northwest Center for CryoEM, PNCC, located at the Oregon Health and Science University and Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, um, and the National Center for CryoEM Access and Training, NCCAT, located at the New York Structural Biology Center. Uh, my name is Christina Zemanyi. I'm a member of the team at NCCAT, and I work primarily on the training side of the center, and I'm moderating today's webinar. Uh, this is the third talk in our uh, monthly series. Our uh, regular date is the last Thursday of the month, uh, today being an exception uh, due to the busy schedules everyone has during the holiday season. Uh, but starting in January, we're back to our regular schedule. Um, so our upcoming dates are here. Um, in January, we'll be hosting uh, Michael Gianfroco from the University of Michigan, who will be telling us about uh, cloud computing tools for CryoEM. Uh, we hope you join us for that talk as well. Uh, you should see announcements for upcoming talks uh, from the center's mailing lists, as well as posts on Twitter and the 3DEM and CCP mailing lists. So watch out for those announcements. Uh, if you've joined us before, we're happy that you're uh, here with us again. And if you've missed uh, any of our previous talks, there are they are available on our YouTube channel. So uh, we made a tiny URL. Uh, CryoEM talks, so you can uh, easily find those. Uh, so every month we're hosting a user of the centers to present their work with a particular focus on practical aspects of CryoEM methods. So along with the biological highlights that uh, come from the, the data um, that are coming from our microscopes, our speakers will talk about the strategies they use to get those results. And we hope these sessions are a useful resource, especially to those of you who are newer to CryoEM. Uh, for that reason, we make sure to leave plenty of time for Q&A at the end of uh, the talk. Uh, we're going to follow our usual format today and start with a very brief introduction from each of our centers so that you better know who we are and what resources are available to you. Uh, so with us today are Michael Schmidt, one of the uh, multi-principal investigators at S2C2, um, Omar Devolhu, a scientific point of contact at PNCC, and Ed Eng, the manager of NCCAT. They'll each give a very short introduction from their centers. Um, and then I believe um, Michael is introducing today's speaker, Professor uh, Suda Chakrapani, uh, who has generously volunteered her time today to tell us about her work. Uh, that leads us to final logistics. Um, Michael will be um, helping moderate the Q&A today. You should have at the bottom of your Zoom um, both a chat and a Q&A. We'll be using the Q&A uh, to um, moderate questions, not the chat, so please put those in the Q&A. Um, also, uh, Joanne Polizzi is here from S2C2. She's helping us with any logistical issues you have. Um, so any Q&A problems or, or other things, you can uh, send a chat to Joanne, who's here with us as well. Um, also, any questions for the centers uh, related to logistics um, of the centers, of uh, the um, Panelists will answer in the Q&A uh, just by typing if they can during the talk. And uh, questions for Suda will mostly be saved to the end of the talk unless we see something very urgent, um, at which point we, we may interrupt her. Um, I think that's it for logistics. So for now, I'll send it over to our representatives. And uh, Michael, you're up first. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Mike Schmid from, oh, uh, can I, sh yeah. Can, oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, right. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, good morning. I'm Mike Schmid and I'm uh, the, the co one of the co-directors of the SPC2 uh, Stanford Slack Cryo EM Center. We have uh, three uh, 
three electron microscopes, Creos microscopes, and preparation equipment. Our missions, like all of the all of the centers' missions, are to um, facilitate and and serve as a service center for high resolution data collection and as uh, training centers to um, to to enable people to become independent researchers in cryo EM. Um, to that end, uh, we've gotten, um, we, during this COVID time, we have conducted uh, remote uh, workshops um, uh, with over 250 to 300 people uh, at these workshops. And we've been able to uh, continue our, um, our data collection during this COVID time in the last three months from, from June to September, for which we have data, uh, we've hosted more than 60 days of data collection with 26 different uh, sessions of, of uh, people coming, or no, excuse me, people sending their, 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 their grids. And uh, we have, uh, we've, we've seen uh, structures that have come out uh, to, um, let's see, better than better than 2.7 angstroms for one of our structures and, um, and 16 structures better than four angstroms. So uh, we are open for business and we're, um, we're, we're able to, to, serve, uh, to serve the community. Um, here's our website and, uh, and uh, we'll have all the um, information for, for data collection and for training. Thank you. All right, so Omar, if you'd like to go next. Yeah, let me see if I can get my screen shared here. Everybody see that all right? Looks good to me. All right, so thanks to Christina for putting this all together and thanks to everyone who's dialed into this seminar. Uh, as Christina mentioned, I'm Omar Devolku and I'm one of the SPOCs or scientific points of contacts at the Pacific Northwest Cryo EM Center which is one of the three sites funded by the NIH Common Fund. PNCC offers its users a seamless workflow from sample analysis and optimization to grid prep, screening, automated high resolution micrograph collection, image analysis, all the way to 3D reconstruction. And in addition to all of the data collection and processing stuff, we also offer training. And although we are currently under restrictions limiting the number of personnel on site, we have continued to offer one-on-one -on -one remote training with users and we'll be offering small remote workshops in the near future. So in terms of hardware, uh, our site has four Titan Creoses, one Arctica and a Glacios on the way. All of our Creoses are equipped with K3 and Falcon 3 direct detectors and two of them are also equipped with Gatan's bioquantum energy filters. In the near future, we're planning on upgrading all of our Creoses with cold fag sources, and a subset of those Creoses will also be upgraded with a Falcon 4 and Catan's biocontinuum energy filter, in addition to TFS's fringe free imaging system. So I would encourage anyone with questions about our site to reach out either here through the Q&A or to visit our website, pncc.labworks.org. There one can uh, look at some Q and A's that uh, we've set up and can also read about and submit proposals for microscope time under either our limited or general access mechanisms, the latter of which provides up to 480 hours a year for two years. So with that, I thank everyone for their attention. We'll hand things off to Ed. Okay, hi, my name is Ed. I'm the manager of NCCAT. And looking at the year, I think something we all are here is thankful. Thankful for you, the user, and allowing us to really help accelerate your Crowium research. Something that the National Center Program has been honored to do is all three centers during the start of the pandemic was able to roll out COVID-19 research access. And just a snapshot of what we've been doing here at NCCAT, we have 20 COVID-19 related proposals. We've actually been able to serve 15 of them and that has produced a lot of good research, even in preprints as well as publications. So I think one thing all of us are, it was honored that we're able to help you and help the nation in this manner. But just because we're in a pandemic doesn't mean research doesn't go on. Uh, we have more access categories than just that. 
and we provide not only instrumentation access, but cross-training. So if you want to find out more, you can go to ncat.nysbc.org and look forward to hearing from you soon. And thank you. Thank you, Ed. I'm going to turn it back over to Michael now. Oh, and you're muted. I was muted, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sudha Chukpani, um, who is the Joseph T. Wern uh, Professor in Medicine and Professor in the Departments of Physiology and Biophysics. She is the Director of the Cryo-Electron Microscopy Core at Case Western Reserve University. And uh, I'll, I'll, uh, her education and training, uh, she was uh, educated uh, in, uh, in India and went to the uh, IIT uh, in biophysics and has her, has her uh, postdoctoral degrees, uh, her doctorate degree is at the University of Buffalo. Uh, she has been uh, at the University of Chicago uh, in 2010, she moved to Case Western Reserve, moved up to the ranks, and she is now a full professor at, um, at, at Case. Now, uh, I would like to, to give her uh, the opportunity to speak uh, about the, her, her seminar today. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, can you hear me okay? And you can see my screen? All right, perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Michael, for the kind introduction. Um, and thank you also to um, S2C2 and NIH Common Fund for the access that we have gotten um, to collect uh, cryogen data. Um, and also for this uh, wonderful opportunity to uh, present our work in this uh, venue. Um, so my lab, um, um, the general theme of what we do, we are interested in understanding uh, molecular mechanisms that are fundamental to the functioning of uh, pentamerically gated ion channels. Um, so these, um, this family of channels um, uh, are central um, to mediating a fast synaptic transmission at the neuronal and neuromuscular junction. Um, so you can think of these channels as transducers um, that uh, convert the chemical energy, which is um, in the form of these neurotransmitters that are released in the presynaptic membrane, and convert this signal into an electrical activity in the postsynaptic membrane. Um, so based on the type of receptors that are present in the postsynaptic membrane, uh, you can have an excitatory uh, signaling that happens um, as a part of uh, depolarization of the membrane or inhibitory uh, signaling that happens from uh, hyperpolarization of the membranes. So uh, pentameric uh, ligand-gated channels, um, uh, the vertebrate uh, uh, family of these includes nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and serotonin receptors, which are both cation selective channels, um, and uh, glycine receptor and GABA A receptors, which belong to the anion selective channels. Um, these channels, so they, they, they play a very important role and dysfunctions have been associated with uh, numerous neurological disorders and pathologies, uh, for instance, epilepsy, congenital myasthenic syndromes, and they're also implicated in drug addiction. Um, these channels are central targets to several classes of therapeutic agents that are in use, anesthetics, alcohols, analgesics, antiemetics. Um, in terms of what we understand from uh, in the structures of these channels, uh, the early insights came from pioneering work of Nigel Anwin. Um, uh, these are electron microscopic work uh, from nicotinic acetylcholine receptors uh, from torpedo electric organ. Um, what has happened in the last five years has been pretty remarkable that the slate of um, the structures that we know from each of these members uh, within this family uh, has increased. And not only do we have one representative um, structure, but also we have uh, many different conformational state for each of these classes of channels. Um, so to uh, look at the overview of how these uh, molecules are built, um, so these channels, as the name suggests, are pentamers, either of um, uh, single subunit or of uh, heteromeric assemblies. So you have the homomers and the heteromeric assembly of receptors. Um, so the channel has three modular domain. So it has an extracellular domain that is primarily beta strands arranged into these inner and outer sheets. The extracellular domain houses the neurotransmitter binding site, which is at the interface between two subunits. 
the transmembrane region um, contains four uh, helical uh, segments that go through the membrane. And the second transmembrane helis uh, from each of these subunit forms the pore of the channel. And the transmembrane domain houses uh, the machinery that is required for gating as well as <clears throat> ion selectivity. Uh, the intracellular domain, which is pretty diverse among the, among the different classes, um, is uh, important for trafficking, but also for post is the site for post-translational modification, as well as is the site where intracellular binding partners bind and modulate uh, expression as well as gating features of the channel. And so, and this is also the intercellular domain has also been sort of this um, rogue domain, uh, which had caused a lot of problems uh, in this early on uh, in terms of structure determination, as well as um, to express this protein uh, in a homogeneous manner. So this domain has been either genetically truncated in the earlier studies or, um, or partly cleaved uh, to enable high resolution structures. So what I'm going to talk about today are strategies that we have used um, uh, in determining different uh, multiple conformational states uh, in serotonin receptors and glycine receptors. Uh, so starting off with uh, serotonin receptors, the high resolution structure came from Nuri's lab uh, back in 2014. Uh, so this is a crystal structure of the receptor. And um, so we build off based on uh, these findings. And the initial uh, glycine receptor structures came both from um, um, Eric Goh's lab, as well as Amgen's group, um, looking at alpha-1 and alpha-3 receptors. Um, so what uh, uh, do we know about these channels in terms of functioning? So we have a basic or a minimal uh, gating scheme to describe um, the functioning of these channels. They are in a resting conformation when there is no neurotransmitter bound. Upon binding of the neurotransmitter, the channel quickly transitions into an open conducting conformation. This state is transient, and the, in the presence uh, of the neurotransmitter, the channel eventually uh, moves into a desensitized conformation. So both the desensitized state as well as the resting conformation are non-conducting. Uh, but in terms of their pharmacological sensitivities, it is well known that these two states are, uh, they have different conformation because they have different affinities for the neurotransmitter, but also has different affinities for various uh, modulating agents that are commonly used therapeutics. So at least in order to have a basic understanding, we need to have structural information of at least these um, three states. But from single channel studies and extensive kinetic analysis, we know that each of these states, is a, what we have put here as one state, is an ensemble state with different lifetimes. So there is a lot of challenges ahead of us. Um, so what I wanted to um, touch upon are three major areas. Um, so our goal was to determine the conformational changes that underlie neurotransmitter mediated activation and desensitization. And our goal was to work with full length receptors. Um, what is the structure and function role of the intracellular domain, which uh, we're missing in many of the earlier structures? And how do modulators alter a function of uh, ligand gated ion channels? So uh, starting off with serotonin receptors, um, these are present, they're, they're ubiquitously present, but their major role is, is in the gut-brain circuitry, especially because 95% of serotonin is released in the gut by enterochromaffin cells. Um, the receptors are present both in the vagal terminals um, as well as in the chemoreceptor trigger zone and vomiting centers that are present in the brainstem. And uh, this sort of uh, activity is important for um, gut motility, secretion, visceral perception, and also um, to trigger emetic reflex. Uh, it, the uh, serotonin receptors are targeted uh, for, alleviated, um, for alleviating nausea and vomiting in patients that are undergoing chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Um, so the, and also um, the antagonists of these receptors are used in pain management. So uh, amongst the common antagonists that are used, um, these are referred to as citrons. Um, so we have the first generation of citrons, um, and uh, which are very effective in the acute onset of uh, uh, vomiting and nausea. And there is also the second generation of citrons, which are preferred for uh, delayed emesis. Uh, even though these receptors have limited um, side effects, uh, there are patients that, um, that have QT elongation and arrhythmias. And uh, sometimes these drugs don't very, work very well in refractory emesis. So there is still um, quite a bit of need to have better um, management of uh, these conditions in cancer patients. 
And um, these the citrons act both centrally as well as at the peripheral um, receptors. Um, so um, let's move on to um, our approach uh, to uh, structurally study these receptors. Um, so like uh, the other members of the family, uh, the serotonin-3 receptors, they activate rapidly um, when they're exposed to serotonin, and then they desensitize in the sustained presence of serotonin. And um, so when you plot a dose response curve, you typically see saturation beyond uh, 30 micromolar concentrations. And in the presence of granny citron, um, so you can see that uh, it, it uh, reversibly inhibits uh, this peak current. And uh, so these are um, high affinity uh, inhibitors uh, working in the nanomolar concentration ranges. So we first started off with um, expressing the full length receptor in um, SF9 cells. Um, these receptor constructs have a 1D4 tag at the C terminus. So our purification is based on the 1D4 antibody bound beads. And uh, we solubilize the protein in C12E9 uh, detergent, and we are able to get a fairly stable uh, pentameric population of the channel. And what we realized early on is that uh, the sample quality was better once we deglycosylated uh, the protein with PNGS um, F treatment. Um, so here are the representative cryo-EM grids um, that we made um, in three different conditions. These were done in different time. Uh, but uh, but for discussion, I think some of the uh, strategies that we have used are applicable across, so I'm putting them all together. Um, so um, so what we did with the freezing condition was the protein after gel filtration, we concentrated it to about 3 milligram per ml. Um, for us, the um, addition of fluorinated phoscolin um, 8 um, really improved uh, protein, um, the dispersion of the molecules across in the grid, and we also had we were able to mitigate some of the preferred orientation issues early on. Uh, we typically use um, uh, copper grids, uh, R1.2, 1.3, with a mesh size 300. Um, so these are our blotting times, and we uh, typically uh, use double blot to increase um, particle uh, concentration on the grids. And we use plunge free to use automated uh, vitro bot at 100% humidity and the temperature set to 4 degrees Celsius. And um, we have collected data um, in uh, K2 as well as K3, and uh, with a typical magnification range of between 81,000 to 130,000. So recent data have all been collected um, on K3 with energy filter. We use a slit of 20 EV. Um, these are our typical doses, and we are using about 40 to 50 frames. And wherever possible, uh, we were able to estimate ice thickness. It has been in the range of 50 to 70 nanometers. Um, we typically collect two shots per hole. We use uh, beam image shift uh, that covers roughly around nine holes. So these particles are picked, and we start off with a manual picking, and uh, we generate a template, which is then used for auto-picking in Reliant. And here are representative 2D classes. Uh, what you can see in each of these conditions is uh, if, uh, if you can really clearly see the screen, you can see there are beta strand features and you can start to see alpha helices and also a part of the ICD, um, even right at the 2D levels. Um, so here is uh, our so roadmap. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, there are some questions that re re uh, especially relate to specimen preparation here. So before you go to, to the structure analysis, uh, we have a couple of questions that, that refer to go this ahead. part of the talk. And so I'd like to bring them up now. Uh, one is why de why de deglycosylate the protein? Was it just better behavior on uh, FSCC, uh, or did you image the sample as well and show that uh, presumably the deglycosylated protein looked better? That's one question. Yeah, that's a good. Yeah, that's a good question. So I, we when we started um, without deglycosylation, we saw some clumping, and um, so then we. Uh, we decided to deglycosylate and things looked better. Uh, uh, surprisingly and ironically, when we solve these structures, we do see all of the glycans in the three aspergines per subunit. Um, so we don't know whether the, the partial deglycosylation helped and you know, we're just seeing these density because of averaging. Um, uh, it's unclear or we, we partly truncated um, the, the glycans. So it seemed to have helped uh, at visually um, in terms of samples, uh, but, but yeah, the glycans are still there. So. So the so some glycans are still survived that treatment. Okay, uh, another one uh, question: Did you observe any effect on receptor stability and solubility 
upon the PNG ACE treatment. I guess that's um, so we right. So we uh, we declare oscillate at um, 37 degrees for two hours. So we see some precipitation um, post declare oscillation, but uh, in terms of the quality of the protein itself, in gel filtration um, seems stable. And uh, we did not have any um, uh, any other additional issues that came about. Just the small precipitation during the incubation phase. Thank you. Those are the questions that that are involving um, specimen prep. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, so here, uh, as you can see, what we have is our workflow is um, fairly standard, and I've just. Um, uh, uh, kept it as they were in the published published papers. So, but what we'll see is we have uh, more uh, advanced post processing step used in the more recent data set. So, um, we do the uh, initial 2D classification. We throw off particles um, which are noisy, and then we use these particles to generate um, 3D, and we do 3D auto refines multiple rounds of these. Uh, and then eventually uh, post-processing, applying a mask, and we got the APO confirmation, uh, APO uh, reconstruction to about 4.3 angstrom. We have uh, we have played around with this data set, and we can get somewhere around 3.9. But intrinsically, in our experience, the APO um, uh, confirmation is highly dynamic, and um, we do. I mean, this is among the poorer resolution for the entire um, confirmation states that we have solved so far. And when we um, imaged and collected data for the 100 micromolar serotonin, again, we used the exact same um, uh, pathway. And what we ended up with uh, for serotonin bound state is we have two different um, confirmations. We have a class called we refer to as state one and a second class that we refer to as state two um, because we did not want to sort of assign a function state um, yet. So uh, if you look at these two, uh, so the state one was better resolved and again had more number of particles around 100K and state two was around 3.9 angstrom. And this is about only about uh, 20K uh, particles uh, in this uh, confirmation. We also collected um, data at 30 micromolar serotonin. And again, we have the exact same um, two conformational state. You can uh, you can overlap uh, these reconstructions from both 30 and 100 micromolar concentrations of serotonin. And but one thing to note is that at 30 micromolar, state one and state two seem to populate uh, to the same extent. And they both had a similar resolution of 3.3 uh, angstrom. Um, then um, we uh, uh, looked at the data set for Granny Citron. Uh, so the Granny Citron data set was collected at S2C2 um, Slack. And this was uh, the best data set at this point at a 2.9 angstrom resolution. And, uh, and since this is a more recent data set, so we uh, did, uh, in addition to the standard uh, data processing steps, we also included Bayesian polishing and per particle CTF refinement um, as post processing steps. And uh, this particular data set resulted uh, in a 2.9 angstrom resolution reconstruction. So of note, uh, only in the presence of serotonin, we observed multiple um, um, conformational states, whereas both APO and serotonin bound, uh, granny citron bound um, samples uh, just gave us one, one state. So this is a, um, a quick movie of uh, the granny citron um, bound serotonin receptors and as you can see that this uh, the side chains for much of the uh, uh, molecule was well resolved and we were able to uh, build an atomic model using this reconstruction um, so this is a pdb um, view of uh, the um, of the model so you have the extracellular domain the transmembrane region and the intracellular domain again this is from the top view and this is looking at it from the bottom view from the in, in, uh, intracellular part of the channel uh, these green uh, density as what you see here are these um, are glycans and as I mentioned early on that even though this was deglycosylated protein we still have densities for all the three aspergens and um, we were a little bit disappointed that we couldn't uh, even though this was a full length channel we still were missing around 60 uh, residues in the intracellular domain and these have has been predicted to be the unstructured part and um, uh, we have some non-continuous density here, but we are still missing a major chunk of the intracellular domain. 
So what do um, these confirmations look? Yeah, one, yeah. We, have, we have one yeah. question about a little bit about the data processing end of this. Um, yes. And uh, you you may you mentioned one of the things that 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 uh, the the full length structure uh, you don't see the full length structure, uh, and two questions uh, both related to whether you were able to uh, or whether you tried to relax the symmetry and and go away from C five symmetry. Um, I guess both of those questions related to that uh, about applying or not applying symmetry. Yes, um, so we did try that and we actually tried that with uh, the Granny Citron data set, which was our best um, uh, resolution reconstruction at 2.9. Um, we did not uh, uh, we did not see anything improve further in the intracellular domain, even at that um, high resolution. And I think we need something more uh, at the biochemical level. We need something that probably binds to that region to stabilize it. So um, even even with C1 and even with focus classification for the DMD and the ICD, it did we didn't get beyond what what we put in the model. Um, so yeah. Um, so uh, uh, in terms of the three confirmations, so I'll just quickly summarize what these confirmations look like. Um, so this is the APO state, um, and this is uh, state one and state two, both bound to serotonin. And we are looking at two subunits, and we're looking at a cross-section of the channel. And what you see uh, is, a, is, a, is a constriction in the ex, uh, extracellular domain as we, as we are moving um, through the pathway through which the ions go through. We see two additional con uh, constrictions, which are narrower than the radius of a hydrated sodium ion. So what we see here is the pore radii plotted along the ax uh, along the this axis of the channel, the lateral axis. And anything that is narrower than this dotted line, which represents a hydrated sodium ion, uh, the channel would impose a barrier uh, for permeation of uh, the hydrated um, sodium ion. So, and the major high, major barrier you see here is uh, leucine 260 or the nine prime residue. And you also see barriers right here at the intracellular end of the channel in the ICD. Again, these hydrophobic residues become very important uh, because uh, even if the pore radii is just at the edge of the hydrated sodium ion because of this, the greasiness, uh, they will not allow uh, dehydration or even partial dehydration of the ions to go through. So, the, so it appears that this channel is non-conducting in the APO state. Um, state one, you see a partial expansion of the pore right at the nine prime residue. Um, and also um, right here at the intracellular end, right, of M2. And state two, you see further widening of the pore. As you can see here, you can uh, track this. Um, this is the APO, this is state one and state two. And uh, we then did molecular dynamic simulations in collaboration with uh, Mark Sampson's group who showed uh, that uh, the APO state is non-conducting, whereas state one has a very low conductance or based on the rotomeric orientation of this uh, leucine residue, whereas state two um, shows um, permeation to um, sodium ions. And I don't have the time to go through um, their data set here, but um, based on those assessments, we uh, we conclude that APO is a non-conducting state and state two is um, a conducting confirmation with state one having low um, low uh, permeation. And if you look at the M2 um, segment uh, and align the, the three structures, what we see is this uh, opening going from the APO confirmation to state one and a full opening in state two. And there is a, a serine residue at the um, two prime position, which uh, supports this bent um, confirmation of M2. And we made uh, mutations to the serine residue, and we show that uh, mutating this residue, perturbing it, um, impacts the open channel stability of uh, the receptor. And so we also made other mutations that stabilize uh, this bent helis because of an interaction between this um, helis and a neighboring um, M3 helis in an adjacent subunit. And uh, we also see an effect on desensitization. Um, so looking at the uh, uh, neurotransmitter binding pocket, uh, it is present at the interface of two subunits. It is lined by an aromatic cage um, of residues. And uh, in, in comparison to the APO confirmation, we see that in state one, there is a blob-like density in this, um, in this pocket. And we also see a similar blob-like density in state two. 
And uh, this blob doesn't allow us to unambiguously orient serotonin molecules. So we refer to uh, the literature to allow us to orient um, uh, the molecule in the binding pocket. And when we look at the conformations in the ECD, so this is APO versus state one and APO versus state two, uh, we see a prominent movement. This is uh, uh, in a region referred to as loop C, which is the capping loop, which caps around the binding pocket. So you have an inward movement of loop C. Uh, you have a twisting movement throughout the extracellular domain where you have the inner helis move, uh, inner uh, strands, beta strands move with respect to the outer beta strands. And this sort of a movement then leads to repositioning of the interfacial loops, the, the loops that are in, at the interface of two subunits, and also loops that interface between the extracellular domain and the transmembrane domain. So these loop regions are uh, mutational hotspots, and uh, perturbations here dramatically affect uh, gating conformation changes and reflected in the uh, kinetic behavior of the channel. So if you align these three, uh, three structures, we see that both state one and state two have um, look very similar in the neurotransmitter binding pocket. And much of the changes in state one and state two has happened um, uh, throughout the extracellular domain. Um, the major differences between these states are in the transmembrane region, where you see that state um, one, there are displacements of the uh, helices. Um, uh, they move away from the pore axis. And this extent of this displacement is much larger in state two. And most notable difference here is the movement of post M3 loop away from the pore axis and also moving this MX helis, which forms a belt around at the interface of the uh, transmembrane domain and the intracellular domain. It's, it's displaced further away from the pore axis. And if you align the three structures, what we see is that the um, you have APO, you have this movement of state one and then further movement of state two. So looking at it at this point, it appears that state one is along um, the activation pathway connecting the APO and state two conformations. And again, the most notable difference is the MX helis moving further away. Um, so what, what's going on? Why does this MX move um, so far out? Um, so if you look at it from the side view, what we see is that in the APO and state one conformation, the M4 and MA helis appears as a single straight helis. Whereas in state two, you have a bend right at the uh, interface of M4 and MA helis, and with, supported by this bend is an outward movement of post M3 loop and the MX. And this sort of a bent movement or the bent conformation is supported by a conserved glycine, and the bent occurs at the I minus, uh, minus three position along the helis. And what is the consequence of this uh, op uh, this bend and this uh, displacement of post M3 loop? Uh, it leads to this creation of a vestibule or a portal, uh, which are likely paths for ions to exit. And this was an uh, idea that was originally proposed by Nig Nigel Anwin. And um, so it leaves us with two different um, paths for the ion exit, one through these lateral por por uh, portals or the other through the lateral axis of uh, the channel. And what we see here is that um, not only are these portals um, present, they are they are open, they are they form in a state dependent manner. So in the APO conformation, you don't see this. Um, in state one, you just start to see this opening, and then you have this wide opening. In um, uh, sorry, this is state two. And so the other notable aspect of serotonin receptor is that um, the the channel has very uh, the the homopentameric A has a very low conductance of the order of 0.1 to 0.4 picosiemen, and it has been attributed to the presence of three uh, arginine residues in the intracellular domain. And what we see here is that these arginines um, line this uh, portal or potential exit pathway for the ions, and it's the electrostatic repulsion that's contributing to um, low single channel conductance. And uh, molecular dynamic simulations from Mark Sampson's group has shown that the, um, the ion exit pathway, uh, the preferred path is through the lateral portals uh, because there is very limited conformational changes in the intracellular end of the channel. So it's still that hydrophobic region seems to stay um, together. Um, um, as a result, the ions exit through the portals. So here is a movie um, that summarizes these conformational changes. You have uh, neurotransmitter binding, you have loop C movement inside, you have iris-like expansion of the transmembrane helices, 
um, leading to this open uh, movement of uh, post M3 loop away, creating this lateral portal through which ions go through. So um, moving on to uh, the granny citron um, data. Um, so uh, unlike what we saw with serotonin, which is a blob-like density, the citron densities were uh, by far the best uh, we saw with 5-HU3 um, with elegans. So you, I, by, again, it's being larger than serotonin, it extends um, further into the interface. So what you see here is this uh, cross-section. You have uh, granny citron extending into the complementary subunit interface. And um, so this is um, the density for um, granny citron. And again, binds in the same pocket. It's, a, it's an orthosteric ligand. Um, the same residues that are involved in serotonin binding are also involved in granny citron binding. And um, also, it is shown in the literature that these residues are, uh, they have an impact um, on granny citron binding. And we also further confirm with mutagenesis that any perturbation to these residues has an impact or affects the inhibition by, uh, by granny citron. We extended these studies to other citrons because um, they all uh, they have varying um, um, efficacies. And in addition, uh, palinocitron, the second generation citron, has been um, in the. It has been suggested that it it's not only an orthosteric ligand but also works as an allosteric ligand, and it binds elsewhere also in the protein. And this binding may be responsible for other features that the ligand has in terms of its longer half life. And so what we found is that um, contrary to that idea, we found only one binding site, which is uh, the, the orthosteric site uh, for, for the ligand. And uh, we looked at um, each of these um, citron molecules. And again, because of very high, the resolution for these were between 2.9 to 3.3. And what we see here is, so you have, there are certain conserved features of the drug. So you have the basic amine group extending into the uh, principal site or the site that has loop C um, and the aromatic end that extends into the complementary site. And we have a carbony linker that keeps the aromatic ring planar. And um, so one thing that was missing in these cryon um, maps, um, or rather what we didn't model from these uh, are the water molecules. And so we, uh, in collaboration with Martha Filizola's group, who has done um, MD simulations for all these drug binding poses, um, so what they find is that um, there are water molecules that are, the interaction with them are different in the different citrons, and that may be contributing to some of the differing um, efficacies. Um, so which is an additional information we get from the um, um, from these structures. Um, so another idea um, in the field has been from the acetylcholine binding protein is that loop C has signature movement in response to the nature of the ligand that binds in the pocket. So agonist leads to an inward movement or closing in, whereas antagonist causes an extension or an outward movement. So what we found here is that um, because we have all these citron um, structures, when you align them, we find that all of these in all of these citrons, um, the loop C seems to move inward along the same path as that of serotonin. Um, so here, for example, we have used state one as a reference. And to the point that in allocitron bound conformation, the loop C position is exactly the same as the agonist. And in addition, some of these movements are also transmitted uh, into the inner beta strands, um, uh, outer beta strands compared to that of the inner beta strands. Um, so these are, um, are, are plots where we have each of these structures and we're plotting RMSD with respect to the APO conformation. As you can see that there are different extents of loop C movement and different extents of movement in the inner, in the uh, outer beta strand that reflect movement along the activation pathway. Um, yet, when we look at the pore profiles, each of these conformations um, for the citron bound states are um, non-conducting and they have a prominent um, um, in a prominent um, occlusion right at the nine prime position. And even though they, they are a bit ex more expanded compared to the APO conformation, it still appears to be non-conducting, um, suggesting that these uh, citron bound states might be um, deeper wells along the activation pathway. And again, non-conducting, but yet along in the same path. So um, I want to you know, um, switch gears and um, spend the next little bit of time on our um, 
a, a more recent project on glycine receptors and talk about some of the strategies we use there, which are different from what we have done with the serotonin um, um, channels. Um, so um, in, with respect to the glycine receptors, so again, the, uh, the same concept. So you have the APO conformation in the presence of the agonist. You have uh, channel opening, which eventually uh, desensitizes. Um, unlike with uh, with the serotonin um, receptors, when we um, when we uh, image glycine receptors in the presence of glycine, we only uh, ended up with one state, and that appeared to be a desensitized conformation. So we needed additional strategies uh, to capture this open or um, or the transient state. Um, so in this case, what we did was we used an open channel blocker, picrotoxin, uh, which has been shown that in the block state, it um, it decreases uh, the transition to the desensitized conformation. So we use that as one strategy um, to capture um, the open state, which again is, is a surrogate for the open state. It's, it's in principle a blocked conformation, assuming that the blocker doesn't do anything beyond plugging the pore. Uh, we also tried um, using potentiators um, such as ivermectin um, to see if we can enhance transition to the open conformation and also um, if uh, the exit to the desensitized state is decreased. Um, so we imaged uh, uh, the receptor in two conditions um, with 0.1 millimolar glycine and 30 micromolar um, IVM, and also with um, with one millimolar glycine and uh, one millimolar mic uh, IVM. Sorry, micromolar IVM. So here are some of the conditions that we used. Um, so again, um, the full length glycine receptors were expressed in SF9 cells. Uh, we used double blotting. Uh, for sample preparation, uh, we used uh, DDM here um, for extraction. And some of the things that uh, we adapted uh, for glycine receptor is we had a selectin soybean polar extract um, all the way from purification until gel filtration. We also supplemented it with um, CHS 0.05%. Uh, um, um, glycine receptor construct had a histag. And upon purification, we reconstituted the receptors um, into E3D1 nanodisc with acelectin lipids. And our freezing conditions are essentially the same that we used um, for serotonin receptors. And also our imaging conditions are um, pretty much um, identical. And more recently, we've been using um, geogrids uh, for, some, uh, for some of uh, the systems where the concentrations are much lower. And so what we see here, these are representative uh, 2D class, and we can see, again, the features in the extracellular domain and the transmembrane helices. But notably, we are missing the intracellular domain uh, densities, which, again, you, you will see it as we, we look into the reconstructions. Um, so this is, the, this is the 3D reconstruction from the APO conformation. So you have the extracellular domain transmembrane helices, and right here is the nanodisc belt. And these little densities right here are for a, uh, for a single set of glycans with a neat subunit. And um, the resolutions that we got um, are for the different conformational states. Um, for the, uh, they were in the range of 3.3 uh, to 3.5. So for the APO, um, the glycine um, um, and PTX bound conformation um, and the glycine alone conformation. And uh, we had some better um, um, resolutions uh, for the, the different IVM uh, bound states. So for, for the two conditions, we ended up with three different conformational states. And these were between 3.3 um, .3 to 3.3 .3 angstrom resolution. Um, so this is the reconstruction um, for IVM and glycine bound GLIR. And so here is the IVM density. And uh, these um, purple ones are the glycans. So as you can see, the IVM molecules, again, this is in the exact same spot um, that was previously shown for GluCL as well as um, uh, the glycine bound, uh, both the glyar alpha-1 and alpha-3 structures. So no surprises there. And so this is the glycine density right here uh, at the interface between the two subunits. So when you compare the topologies um, for both the glycine uh, receptor APO conformation and the serotonin receptors, um, so you see uh, that they are, um, there is a lot of conserved features, but there are also notable differences. And these differences especially are um, very prominent in the intracellular domain. We have a lot more structured features um, 
in the serotonin receptors with respect to the MX helis and, and the long MA helis. Whereas in case of glycine receptors, so you have the M3 uh, continues into a short stretch of post M3 helix, and then you have much of the ICD being unstructured, and that, which leads into a short uh, pre M4 helix, and then you have the M4 um, helix after that. And there are also notable differences um, in the uh, extent of interactions. Um, you have a much longer post M4 uh, helix that extends um, out of the membrane and position to interact with the extracellular domain loops. And so um, in terms of the confirmations, uh, in the absence of any glycine, we have um, uh, an apostate which has uh, two constrictions in the transmembrane region at the nine prime position and at the 13 prime position. So, uh, conserve, so in all of these um, uh, channels, you see this, uh, the APO conformation appears to be constricted at the nine prime position, which is conserved. But the number of other constrictions and the extent of constrictions seem to vary between channel types. Um, and uh, then we look at the glycine bound state where you have the opening of the pore, as you can see the pore radius expanded across. Uh, but you have a new constriction now at the minus um, uh, two prime position, which is a proline. And in the presence of uh, glycine, but with PTX also, you have a widening of the pore, which is to the exact same extent as that of glycine alone bound structure, but you don't see this uh, constriction here anymore. And so this, as you can see, this channel appears to be a conducting channel. And again, we collaborated with Mark Sanson group. Um, they did molecular dynamic simulations uh, in membranes for each of these conformations. And they found that both uh, APO and glycine states are bound states are non-conducting, while the gly glycine PTX um, uh, with the PTX removed is a conducting conformation. Um, and uh, we see the PTX density right in the vicinity of a six prime threonine residue. Um, and what is interesting to note is that even though PTX binds slightly above, um, uh, it inhibits this conformational change. Uh, so this is glycine bound um, alone, and this is with PTX. You see that the proline constriction uh, is prevented when PTX a bulky molecule is bound right here at the six prime position. Um, and here is the glycine um, density uh, looking at the binding pocket. And interestingly, so when you have glycine bound, you have a major conformational change uh, at the subunit interface. You have loop C moving in, and you also have loop B moving in. So these um, interfacial loop move in um, to cap uh, the ligand in the binding pocket. And uh, here is a movie that summarizes uh, various movements. So you have the APO conformation and then loop C movement inside. And again, very similar to us as we have seen in serotonin receptor, just that some of the movement of these loops, the extent of which is different. And uh, here is uh, looking at the transmembrane helices. Again, um, a well uh, behaved uh, iris like movement of the helices and causing an expansion of the pore. And we are looking at it from the bottom view. And, and you see this uh, rotation uh, movements from the inside as well. So we also, again, when what happens when these helices move outward? One of the consequences is that both the inter subunit and the intra subunit cavity volumes um, change uh, during this conformational change. And these uh, move, uh, these volume changes and also polarity changes are important because uh, these are the um, the locations where several allosteric modulators bind. And just as an example, going back to IBM, it it binds uh, at the inter um, at the interface between two subunits right here. And one thing interesting that I want to conclude with is that with the IVM bound structures, when we compare, the goal was of using IVM was a way to trap the open conformation. But in all of the IVM bound states, uh, we still had a desensitized conformation. Uh, we had a constriction uh, at the two prime position. And uh, we see this as well in all the three conformational states. But when we align it together, it appears that the IVM bound conformations lie somewhere along uh, in between that of the uh, the open and the desensitized state. So you have the APO 
uh, confirmation, you have the open state or the uh, PDX box state, and then you have the desensitized confirmation. Uh, each of these IBM states appear to be somewhere in between that of the open and the desensitized state. And molecular dynamic simulations with these confirmations suggest that there is, this is a low conductance uh, confirmational state. So with that, um, just a quick summary. Uh, I think CryoEM has uh, enabled uh, as to look into and get a peek of what these intricate molecular motions are that underlie neurotransmitted mediated activation uh, in ligand gated ion channels. And so what we see is a quaternary changes in all the three domains, and, um, and which sort of explains how these domains have crosstalk uh, in both directions, um, uh, affecting functionality of each of these individual domains. And there are notable differences uh, in the intracellular domain um, of cationic and anionic members. And again, uh, there are some, so many of many features of these structural mechanisms are conserved, but yet there are notable differences that may account for differences in kinetics and, and also in the dichotomy that you see with allosteric modulation between these receptors. And so um, my acknowledgement slide, people who have actually done all of this work, um, Sandeep Basak, who's a postdoc in the lab, ready to start his own lab. He um, led the uh, serotonin receptor project all the way uh, from cloning the receptor in the lab to um, getting all of these structures, uh, working with Iwan Gichero, who is a graduate student, who was a graduate student and now is a principal investigator at Roche. Uh, the glycine receptor project was led by Arvind Kumar. And um, um, to thank our collaborators, the person who got us started with CryoEM Lab is Vera Moisin Bell and her group. And we got a lot of inputs um, from Derek Taylor's uh, lab uh, for data processing and Marvin's Labor's lab for helping us get started with InsectSub. And um, CryoEM Access, we have collected data um, at S2C2, and you know our, our best data set came from them um, right off the bat. And uh, the recent data sets have been collected at the CryoEM core at Case Western and also at um, NCI Frederick um, facility, uh, which was where we started CryoEM work um, and funding. And thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Suda. I think uh, in, in an actual room, there would be a big round of applause. So we can all imagine that. <laughs> I'll point out our, our time is almost up. So uh, okay. for those of you who have to leave us, um, we, we will stay as long as uh, Suda is available um, to answer the questions left and the recording will be up. So if, if um, anyone needs to come back for answers to burning questions, you can. Um, otherwise, we hope you uh, join us again in uh, January, look out for the announcements, uh, but we'll stick around and uh, get as many of the questions that we have uh, in the Q&A answered. Hi, thank, thank you, Christina. And thank you, Suda, for the, for the great seminar. Um, we have some questions about that refer back to the, to the serotonin receptor uh, work. And uh, that, that involves, do you also see two open states? This would be electrophysiology, I guess. Do you also see two open states in single channel records corresponding to state one and state two uh, uh, with the serotonin bound uh, that, that, would, that, would, uh, that, that would validate two separate open states? Yeah, a great question. And um, I must admit that there is um, still quite a bit of disconnect uh, between what we see from structures and what they actually may represent um, in a in a functional um, um, scenario with uh, in membranes um, um, in uh, under physiological conditions. Um, so, what does the state uh, one, which seems to be a low conductance or non-conducting state, what does it correspond to? Is it like a pre-open state? Is it a desensitized conformation? Uh, it's unclear, and um, so I think that we'll have to do more studies and perhaps look into different modulators and look into conditions that may that we know from electrophysiology may stabilize one state or the other um, to get a better understanding. So, so yeah, I think the, the biggest hurdle right now is to uh, tie up these um, structural states to, um, to functional conformations. So it's, it's, it's still a barrier, yeah. Thank you. And there are two questions about uh, symmetry, uh, especially in the, uh, in the, in the glycine receptor, um, the 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 PTX density that you put in the uh, in the pore, as a pore blocker, uh, you 
the the symmetry is c5 but uh but of course the 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 uh, the, blo the blocker does not have c5 symmetry so you you uh do one confirmation of the of of the five possible i guess for the for the uh for the uh, picker toxin so w how do you handle uh the density which is fivefold averaged versus the uh versus the structure which is not fivefold averaged Yep, that's an issue, and I think that um, the, the limitation for us was that the maps were not uh, that that um, uh, that reconstruction was among the lower resolution ones. So we we had to struggle with it, and we tried um, improving resolution, but we at that point we weren't successful. And um, so uh, I think it is best done with the GABA receptor structures with um, the heteromeric GABA with PTX density, very well done. So we don't have that benefit here. So I think, yeah, that's a limitation. And again, it's also a very blob-like density. We, we see it only when we have PTX, but yeah, but it, it's, it's an it's a issue with our, with our condition there. Oh, and that's, that's another question for validation. Uh, you only see that with the PTX bound, you said. Uh, people were worried about the fact that it's on the fivefold axis might be an artifact of the of the symmetry imposition. Uh, but but uh, how would you then uh, validate? And, and you're answering that question by saying right, exactly. So I think that it's it's it lies. Uh, so I mean, it has to be tied up to other uh, indirect means. One is that it's known that PTX binds in that location, so we weren't attributing a new site to it. Um, and the other thing is that. Um, uh, when you have when you have PTX, you have a certain change at the at the intracellular end at a minus two prime position that you don't see um, when you don't have PTX. So it seems again, all these are I, I admit all these are indirect way of validating. We tried increasing the concentration of PTX. Um, we went up to five millimolar, and we still you know see the same kind of a blob uh, in the C5 axis. So so yeah, so I think uh, we do have that limitation. Right? Okay, and there are two questions involving the uh, the serotonin, uh, the, the both both uh, receptors, um, the um, and the their interaction with the lipids that are in either your nano disc or the or the uh, my cell that you're doing. Um, <clears throat> do you see any specific interactions with lipid molecules in 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 either of those cases, specifically with the M4 M3 helices? There may be related to the the gating behavior uh, with by presumably by specific interactions with lipids. Yep, uh, great question. So we do see um, lipid and lip, lipid like densities in these locations. Um, the identity of which is unclear. So uh, we don't know what's coming with purification. We see that um, even in a in a in detergent micelle conditions. So they they come with um, extraction uh, during um, solubilization process. And in case of uh, glycine receptors in nanodisc, we see several lipid-like densities. Uh, the identity, uh, we, we, we don't have much clarity on what these, what these lipid um, molecules are. Um, so, I, I mean, we modeled it as phosphocholine um, in some cases, let's say in nanodisc when we did this with azolectin. Uh, but yeah, I think we need additional um, uh, experiments, we'll have to to identify what these lipids are and also perhaps follow it up with mutagenesis to show um, that this interaction is key to certain functional behavior. There's a lot in the literature out there, but we personally haven't um, validated uh, the lipid protein interactions. Okay, one more question then about um, that, that in fact is kind of logistical. Uh, do you have access to a, uh, a scope for screening before you send your uh, grids to to the um, to the centers, uh, and how how do you handle um, you know uh, validation of your of your specimen preparation conditions before you send them to the to the centers? Yeah, so we have a, a TF twenty microscope in house that has been used even before our creos arrived. Um, so all of the um, initial um, uh, screening of the grids uh, were done in house, and um, and we uh, typically send about uh, eight grids um, um, to the to the centers, and 
the center staffs have always uh, been very supportive, um, um, also doing a mini screening, um, helping us choose which of the grids that we want to actually image. Uh, but yeah, but, I, but most of the uh, important initial screenings were done in-house. So can, can I pop in with a question I have related to screening? So you, you showed you have four different antagonist bound structures of the serotonin receptor. Um, are these much more straightforward to get once you have base conditions or do you have to do some amount of screening for your grid prep for each of the new antagonists? Yeah, I think uh, much of it depends on the solvents that are being used to solubilize. Um, so if they are um, the same, um, I think uh, the conditions were almost identical. There's not much difference. Uh, but again, I think in, even in spite of that, I think some of the antagonists gave us better maps than the other. Now, is it because there are subtle differences or is it just that, you know, we didn't go back and collect many. We had our one, we collected a data set, worked, we just stuck with it. And so I, I wouldn't know, but definitely solvents that are used um, for solubilizing these ligands, they, they make a big difference. And many of these are hydrophobic. So ethanol, DMSO, all these things make a huge impact. And that, that affects the condition and how much of the ligand you want to add. Okay, I believe that's all the questions that I can field from the question and answer. Uh, Christina, you want to wrap it up? Yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks, Suda, for sticking around a couple extra minutes to get those questions answered. Um, and I don't have anything else to say other than uh, please join us again next month. There will be a new registration link. Um, and for now, uh, just look out for announcements in the regular places for that. And uh, thank you all for, for joining us today. And thanks again. Thank you so much.